Hi, Whitney. How are you? I've been a writer most of my adult life. I taught English to high school students for about eight years. And as part of that, you just start having these ideas and they start coming out, largely because once you read enough essays, you need some creative outlet. And uh, so I started writing. And then I, I decided that I wanted to pursue my, uh, my master's in it. And I got, so I have a master's in, in fine arts of creative writing. And um, as I was doing that, my, my children would come to me and say, Daddy, what are you doing? And so they would sit down. And I would read them little sections of whatever I was working on. And I'll tell you, kids are by far the greatest critics that you ever have because there is no filter. So if it's good, they'll tell you right away. And if it's bad, well, it's time to go back to the drawing board. And I know that your kids are a, a big topic um, and big subject for, for some of your writings. As a parent, there's so much about my kids that – I, I learn more when I reflect. And writing about them helps me to, to understand them more clearly. But then there's also the fact that I want to give them a record of who I knew them as when they were children. And someday when they read these things, I want them to know how much I loved them and how I tried to understand them and, and give them the best that I could. So when my son Timothy was born, he was given a diagnosis of a genesis of the corpus callosum. And it's a very rare illness. They, they estimate it's somewhere about 1 in 19,000 children are born with it. And the problem with a diagnosis that's that rare is there's not a lot of research. And so the day that he was born, we were told he might never sit up. He might never feed himself. He might never walk. He might never talk. And in that moment, you know, once we had sorted through all of that and realized exactly how wonderful he was, we wanted to make sure that other parents didn't have the same panic that we had at the hospital because no one should have to be afraid of the day their child is born. It's a celebration, and my wife and I work very diligently to try and, and help people feel that regardless of who their child is at birth, their child is a gift. I never want to come across as being, you know, uh, truly – um, special or unique in, in parenting because I'm not. Uh, I make this up one day at a time. And really for us, it's that's all we can do is, with, you know, with three kids, it is one day at a time and every day is different. Um, and that's another thing I like to talk about with parents is just that if you can just go through one day at a time, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, because whether or not children have special needs, they are a lot of work. And so I think that's one of the things I want to do is make it okay for parents to feel human and to feel that they're accepted mistakes because they will. And it's not the end of the world. We just get up and dust ourselves off and do better the next day. Uh, I think the piece I connect most with is the very first thing that I wrote for Spork um, called When They Tell You. And it's, it's the story of, you know, learning that my son, uh, had had special needs when we'd had no notion of that. So we, we found that out the day that he was born. And in the course of it, that day then, having to process this news and hear this horrible diagnosis, which was they got it wrong. I mean, the diagnosis was correct. The prognosis was completely wrong. But they didn't know any better. They thought they were being helpful. And so – the thing I, I remember most in that moment was deciding the biggest thing is this. I have a son and he's alive. And if my if I have a son and he's alive, it's a good day. Everything else can can, you know, it is a bonus. If he's alive and healthy, that's a bigger bonus. If he's alive and someday we can, you know, walk together, that's just a celebration. And so very quickly, my wife and I were able to shift our focus to let's celebrate everything that he does rather than worry about the things that he doesn't do. Because at the time, we didn't, again, if, you know, we didn't know he, if he would sit up. Um, today, obviously, uh, you know, he was out biking and he he flipped over the handlebars and scratched his knee up and I'm okay. So clearly, once those things happen, you change your outlook. But from the very beginning, it's always been a celebration rather than a series of markers that we had to get to. Uh, 
Um, and so every time I read that piece, I actually wept as I wrote it. My wife wept when she read it um, because it was just so intense to relive what was both the best and hardest day of our life. I, I guess maybe for everybody that, that's watching this, a, a quick discussion of ACC at this point might be useful. The best way to think about it is the brain consists mostly of two hemispheres, a left and a right side, and most people know that. You know, and they say that your left side is your more um, logical and organized side, the right side tends to be a little bit more artistic and creative. Uh, there's a bundle of nerve fibers that, that's kind of right at the base of the, the brain uh, called the corpus callosum. And it's the bridge between the left and the right hemispheres. Um, and what people may not know is that there are a lot of functions cross over that, that bridge. So for example, when you raise your right hand, it's actually your left brain that's controlling it. Um, your left brain controls your right eye and vice versa. Well, Tim was born with this condition, agenesis, which means uh, no development or un underdevelopment of this corpus callosum. So he doesn't have that connection between the left and the right sides of his brain. Um, and that sounds, and actually when, when you see an MRI uh, of this, it can be horrifying because there's a gigantic black hole where you should see lots and lots of uh, nerve tissue. But the beauty of, of the human brain and, and the beauty of so many uh, people with, with agenesis of the corpus callosum, which we shortened to ACC because, let's face it, agenesis of the corpus callosum is a mouthful. I had to do quite a few Google searches on how to pronunciate it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and there is actually debate. Some people call it the corpus callosum, some the corpus callosum. There, they go back and forth, and I just, I'm happy with this one, you know. Um, but the, the, the amazing thing about the, the human brain is that it wants to find a, a workaround. And so Tim was born and he was developmentally del delayed. He didn't sit up till he was almost, uh, 10 months. He didn't walk until he was about 16 months. He didn't eat solid food until he was 14 months. He didn't talk until about 14 months as well. But what was happening all of that time while he was in various therapies. We were doing physical therapy and occupational therapy and play therapy and speech therapy. And his brain was actually rewiring itself to get around the fact that he doesn't have a corpus callosum. And so he will still, you know, there are things that he will struggle with for his entire life, but his brain is amazingly resilient. Um, he loves doing math. He loves doing math. Don't know why, but that's his thing, so we're happy. Um, he loves to write stories. Um, and actually, I'm going to, to plug his YouTube channel for just a second, if I can. Ew. He has a YouTube channel, and it's called The Magic Brain Kid. And what he wanted to do was use YouTube to reach out to other kids and, and even adults who have a genesis of the corpus callosum and just talk to them about like to have it. He wanted to reach out to parents whose children have it. Um, we did not coach him into doing this. This is something he wanted to do, to do on his own. Um, so he's got a YouTube channel where he goes and he sits in front of the computer and he, he does his crazy, happy little thing. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's doing an art and a craft that he wants to come up with. Sometimes he wants to talk about his brain. Um, we just let him do it. And, but what it, what it really does, and this is why we wanted to let him do it, it shows people that you can have, you know, a special need, you can have, you can be otherly able. And your quality of life is amazing. And you're doing exactly what other people are doing. It took him a little bit longer to get there. I don't care. Are you kidding me? He knows more about using YouTube than I do. Like, there's, there's, and that's the thing. There's no shame in being otherly able. There's no shame in taking your time and doing things at your pace. And he is such a beautiful example that, you know, the, the things he's learned and the challenges that he's faced demonstrate, I think, the value um, of the challenges that he's been through because he is very compassionate and very kind and loving. 
and he's also very empathetic and he understands you know when we say somebody has to go to the doctor well he's gone to the doctor quite a bit so he's able to feel for these people and he really has a heart to try and help others um, who also have special needs one one rule that we've always had since he was born was we we did not care what his abilities were but we cared what his character was and it didn't matter if he was slow in developing something he could still be kind he could still be giving and so he grew up learning those things first and then it you know it's developed from there um and so we're very fortunate with him because there are people who have a genesis of the corpse callosum where the outcomes aren't nearly as favorable um it's a center line condition and when those things and that means it affects you know the center of the body and many people with this have um let's see hydroplasia for example so you know what like and um they also have heart conditions because again it's right there at the midline sometimes some lung issues and we were blessed that timothy doesn't have any of those things you know there are people out there who have acc with a much harder road to walk and that's why we try to stay so positive because relatively speaking we've got it pretty good yeah, that actually reminds me of your uh, newest article that that you uh, released and submitted to to Sport Typical, um, because there was um, a particular line in there towards the end that really stood out to me, which is um, to just a sloppily kind of paraphrase: um, as a parent with your child, you need to feel comfort in your child's typical behavior um, instead of weighing it against what the actual typical might be yes and so much of what well i've come across and my wife has come across um, are parents that that struggle with just you know is it okay to ask these questions is it okay to be nervous is it okay that i'm worried or upset or or having these you know bad days and the reality is that it's okay to have those things and you're going to be nervous and scared as a parent and you should be. Um, and so, but I think this, the world does a really good job of telling people you have to be perfect. You have to get it right the first time. And so in my writing, I'd like to be a place where, where parents can learn that, Hey, you know what? You're not alone and you're doing a good job. It, the reality is that not every day is a good day, but then the reality is also not every day is a hard day. And I, I think that, it, and I found this in myself, that there are times that I get into a, into a rut and things are difficult and I just kind of put my head down and I just assume it's going to be hard forever. And then we break through that moment and the world opens back up and, and I realized that all of that hardness that we, that hardship that we went through was actually a really good thing because it helped uh, my children develop and it helped me learn more about how I can help them. Which also reminds me of another article that, that you wrote about, um, about taking your son to the zoo with the Gibbons and you know, <laughs> laughing at the Gibbons. And I, it, you, when your writing paints such a very vivid scene, um, whenever you kind of go into these memory kind of flashbacks and everything, um, could you tell me a little bit more about that day? Yeah. So there had been, there, I believe there were 10 of us in, the, in, in a house. We were all on spring break. Um, it was my in-laws, my, my wife's parents. And so my wife and I and Tim were sharing a bedroom. He wasn't sleeping very well because he was only five months old. Uh, so we weren't sleeping very well. Um, everyone was sort of, we were cooped up because it was too cold to go to the beach. So everybody was kind of cranky and it was just sort of an unpleasant, day um no one was happy and so my wife and i wanted to go just get out of the house i was carrying the you know the diaper bag and we had a camera and just there's like ten thousand things the newborn i was just i was trying to be quiet and let my wife have a good time let let tim my son have a good time and then we got to feed these giraffes um and it was amazing there because they let the giraffes come up within five feet or so of, of people and you just hand them food. And he was enraptured. 
and and we thought that was great. That was a very good moment for us. But then as we we started walking to the next exhibit, that's when we saw these gibbons in a cage. And I still to this day don't know why Tim started laughing. You know, he'd never laughed at anything before. Um, that was one of his delays. And we just never knew if he was going to laugh. And then all of a sudden he sees this gibbon that's just making these crazy noises at him. And he just started cracking up. And, and the beauty of that moment was that everything else was so bad that in, in, in all of that nightmare of a vacation, there's this wonderful moment where my son has a breakthrough and it was just pure and unfiltered joy. And, you know, there are so few moments in life where everything is just right. And I loved uh, the thing that sticks with me about that is that it was right because everything else was so wrong. And I think if it had been a fun vacation, we might not have even noticed. When, when Spork offered me the opportunity to come on as a writer, I wanted to accept because I think there are a lot of people out there who don't know how to express these stories. They don't know how to, to think about their own joy. And one of the things that I think is so wonderful about Spork is giving voices you know, to the voiceless. But part of that is giving voices to the parents who are doing the hard work behind the scenes. Um, because it is, you know, to raise a child well is an incredibly difficult thing. And there's almost no, no one ever comes along and pats you on the back and says, you're doing a great job. And if you do it well, your kids will never know how hard it was. And so they won't think anything of it. Um, and I would like to be a voice for those parents and parents to give them a sense, you know, that, that they are seen and they are appreciated for what they're doing. There's, there's this other thing too, which is that as we form community, um, we are much stronger together in providing resources. And a lot of parents that I come across, especially new parents, they just don't know where to turn. They want to do everything they can for their children, but they have no idea. And particularly with some of these rare conditions and non-apparent conditions, there's not um, easy resources available. And so if we band together, we can develop some of those resources. A lot of parents, when they, when they receive the same diagnosis that Tim has, doctors will tell them, you should abort your child because they will have no quality of life, which is absolutely untrue, you know. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but the thought that there will be no quality of life is absurd. And if the first thing a parent hears is you should abort your child, it distorts their entire relationship for the rest of their lives. You know, our children, regardless of, of the challenges they face, they are a gift. And we, we try to help parents who are scared realize that it is a gift. And, they, you know, it's okay to be scared. Just know that your child is going to be wonderful. And once they know that, and once they have their feet, you know, rooted in, in a little bit of, of help, it is amazing how far other parents will go to become advocates and pass the same kind of thing along. And so, you know, if we can do one thing and that spreads, and then, you know, more parents can do this, the amount of support that will exist for uh, people with special needs of all kinds um, will just drastically increase. And I think that's the end goal is a world where people who have special needs, whether they're a parent or not, have exactly the resources they need to live exactly the kind of lives that they're capable of leading. That's so true. And I feel like when you have that support system, if your first root of support system, if you are um, fortunate enough to have it in your family, that really does take you a long way throughout your life. You know, the, the tragedy is, because of what you just said about having family as your, your first support, is how many families turn against their, their own because of the diagnosis. You know, we see that with, with new parents. You know, we, we deal in particular with a genesis of the corpus callosum, but, but I'm sure this happens in many other special needs communities as well, that, that a diagnosis appears and family turns their back. And it's heartbreaking to me because the people who should be closest sometimes just can't handle it. And 
that's when I think the community at large has to be strong. Yes. Because now we have, you know, parents who don't have any support anywhere else and they desperately need it more than ever because now they've been told by their family, well, your your child isn't okay. Mm -hmm. And it's heartbreaking. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because the diagnosis is one of those um like I feel like beautiful weighted balloons. It is either great news because you finally have answers to questions and at least some sort of trajectory that you can build upon or it can be difficult news because now you're confronted with all the stigmas all the everything negative that might yes. come in that territory um that's difficult it, it is very difficult and i think sometimes it's actually both because people who mean well and want to support you end up doing some things that are just unintentionally horrible. Um, one of the things that, that, that we've heard, of course, is, you know, oh, God doesn't give special children to people who aren't like special parents, or God doesn't give you, you know, special kids unless the parent can handle it. No, that isn't true. I don't think God is, is using your kids as a test of your faith. I think God is allowing you to journey with your kids because he sees the beauty in them and he's letting you experience that. And I have to say, because um, I feel like it's, it's also hard not to talk about all of this without also kind of talking about the current situation, the COVID virus that's been going yes. on. And which, I mean, I feel for anyone is added different layers of difficulty. If you don't mind, can you share with me some of um, your y'all's experience um, with this whole COVID situation, how that has looked like for you guys? Um, I've been deemed essential, but in order to keep our office um, clean, I'm only in the office one day out of three. So it's a rotating schedule, but I'm not there very much. So I'm mostly at home. Um, and what it's been then is we, we get up in the morning. And my wife and I will split up the boys and we'll do some form of school, whether it's math or handwriting or reading. Um, we will, you know, go through those kinds of things. Um, what's been hard about COVID, I think, has been that, that the boys miss their friends. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the areas where both of my sons struggle is taking the the things they know in their mind and understanding how to feel about them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my other son, Isaac, here a little bit more. Um, so Isaac is, is a year younger than Timothy, and he's we don't we don't have a diagnosis. We know that he has a speech delay and a, gel, a general de developmental delay, but we don't really know that. Those are just kind of blanket terms to cover that he's he has challenges. Um, now, he has been ecstatic about this stay at home at COVID because school for him has been very, very unhappy. Um, he has friends at school, but because of his, um, his speech impediment, it's very hard for his friends and his teachers to understand what he's saying. So communication becomes exhausting for him. And a lot, what we discovered was because he is very bright, he was doing just enough work to coast along and get his teacher to kind of ignore him. And then he would go off and play in the corner and he really wouldn't do whatever the activities for the day were because he didn't feel like it. And so for, for him, COVID has been a great blessing. He's at home. Um, he loves, for example, Pokemon, loves them. And we've been able to incorporate that into doing speech. Um, we're able to, he also loves dinosaurs. We're able to use dinosaurs to get him to, to work on his handwriting and do some of his occupational therapy. Um, so for Isaac, it has been a chance to be focused on in, in ways that he typically isn't. Um, and so he's very much impacted at school um, simply because he is, he's very bright but he struggles to communicate. 
And actually, COVID has, as my wife and I have decided that for his kindergarten year, um, we're going to homeschool him. Uh, my wife was a kindergarten teacher for eight years, so we've got some background in it. But it's going to be a chance for Isaac to develop at his pace, but being focused on and being held accountable to do the hard work because he is able to do it. He just has to focus. And up till now, he hasn't had to. Um, but he is also excited because in his mind now, he is special. You know, th yeah. this makes him special. And so he gets to stay home and do school while Tim will be going back once COVID is over. Oh, wow. So do, do you think that um, you and your wife would have come to the conclusion of homeschooling him for that if, if not for basically the situation with COVID? And I think we might not have. We had discussed it occasionally because we could see how unhappy he was and how relatively little scholastic progress he was making. You know, um, in things like handwriting and and some of those things where the samples were coming home, and we knew from experience what he could be doing, and he just he wasn't doing those things. Um, so we were debating what to do. And COVID actually simplified things for us because of how he's flourished in this environment, because now he wants to do the work. He wants to try, um, which is not to say that every day is perfect. Again, you know, he's he's a five year old boy. He's my son. So he's strong willed. Um, <laughs> he, uh, you know, but more often than not, he's enjoying it. And today when he was uh, he had speech therapy um, w with his therapist and she asked him, you know, why do we work so hard on this? And his answer was because people won't make fun of me. And it broke my heart because he what what hurts is that he knows that people know that he's different and you know it's it is very difficult to celebrate with your child um a difference that makes their life harder with timothy we can we can celebrate the progress that he's made from where he could be and with isaac he struggles to to feel like he's making progress because it's still hard for him to be understood. And so that's actually one of the things that, that we're wrestling with now is how do we give Isaac the same sense of accomplishment that his brother has? Because his struggle is just as real and just as difficult as Timothy's. But again, because we don't really know the root cause, we're still groping around trying to find solutions. And we keep hoping that finally, you know, we're going to find whatever the thing is that's behind all of this. Uh, because like you mentioned at the beginning, you know, once you know the diagnosis, there's a trajectory that can be followed. And so we are just, you know, we're so grateful that we're, we're getting this chance with Isaac to, to really see who he is and what his needs truly are. Because if he had just stayed at school, this might not have happened. Mm -hmm. And so we're we're blessed. You know, I I don't want to make light of, of COVID nineteen, but we are blessed because the situation has given us an opportunity uh, to care for our son. And I'm I'm sure that the memories that Isaac is going that is going to have from this that bonding experience alone of just being able to spend that extra amount of time with his parents, um, I feel like. It, that that can't be undervalued. This is, you know, this is an area where I, I will always struggle because it it is so easy to be proactive when you know what the next step is. When when let's do this, then this, then this, um, and it is it's much more challenging to be sort of drifting. Um, but it is, I think it's good for me as a dad because that's exactly what Isaac feels. He's drifting too. You know, his speech has improved in, tremendously and, and we're getting much, much better. Um, you know, his, when he gets his evaluations, his, uh, 
I guess the level at which he's understood is about half the time now, which is fantastic. Um, but when I'm frustrated, it reminds me that he feels that and more because he doesn't have any other option. And so it is very humbling, but it's also very important because it helps me forget about what milestones we should be hitting and focus on what does Isaac need today? Because in the end, that's that's what matters. Like you said, he's going to remember those those snapshots of like the fun things we did that day that he needed, rather than the sitting and drilling the, the flashcards. I think the most important thing is that that we all have to remember that that every day is a choice. And when you get up in the morning, you have to decide what kind of day it's going to be. Because the the external reality is going to be what it is. You know, I mean, and that, that goes for simple things. Maybe Today your car breaks down and it's a bad day or, you know, but then when it comes to kids, it's who am I going to be today as a parent? Am I going to be the parent that celebrates my kids or am I going to be the parent that is so hung up on the rules and getting things right that I'm just going to drive them? And, and I have to be honest. There are days that I don't make the right choice. I, I don't want to come across as a, you know, a holier than thou or like a perfect parent or something because I'm not. There are a lot of days that I need to redo. I'm frustrated. I'm tired. And, you know, the kids don't get the best of me and they deserve it. Um, and so my takeaway would be for everybody, uh, parent or not, that make the decision about what you want the day to be. And more importantly, who are you going to be today? Nothing else, you know, matters. Yesterday is gone. You can't, you can't change it. Tomorrow is going to take care of itself. But how can I be the best version of me for the people that I love um, so that they can have the kind of life that they deserve? Yeah, to just give yourself a simple one or two word label, what would it be? Uh, proud father. More than anything in the world, that is who I am. Um, and so that's kind of what the writing dad was about. You know, I am a writer, but it's about my kids, you know, in the end. Um, and I just, I'm so proud of them and I'm proud that I get to be their dad. Um, and, and so, you know, and that's who I am. I, I think of myself first and foremost as their dad. And it's the best thing in the world. John, that's beautiful. Thank you so much um, again for taking the time and for speaking with us. Um, I can't even count how many treasure troves you touched upon, how many <laughs> wonderful walking away points that you touched upon for other parents who might be listening, who might be um, just in a level of unsurety, I, you know, from everything I've gathered about being a parent, you know, it's all, there's no perfect way. Um, and each kid is something different. So, you know, I really appreciate um, you talking so candidly about that raw experience for, for you and your life. Well, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, I think that what Spork is doing is remarkably important. And I think that it's an honor to be a part of the organization because there are very few places left in the world where you can, as an individual, make a difference. But Spork is one of those places. And so I'm grateful for the work that you do, for the organization, um, and just for the love that, that you give to the whole community and the way that you support um, all of your writers, your, your artists. Um, to give us a voice in a world that tends not to listen 